So, Children's Church. Any of our little ones like to go back to Children's Church? Rhonda is waiting back there. You can go now. Or not. Or maybe later if you decide to go. The ushers will show you where Children's Church is. Maybe if y'all don't like the sermon today, you can go back there as well. Go, Luke. It's okay. <laughs> I'm not offended. <laughs> okay. David, you ready? Are you? I'm ready. Let's pray. Oops. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. We can come together as a family. Family from near and far. We lift you up. We lift uh, Gary up to you as he lifts your word up to us. Pray that you bring the spirit on him to give us the message that we need to hear today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I know. You fix that? My lectern broke up here while we were praying. <laughs> David's fixing it. There. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you today. Glad that you're here. Um, a lot of folks here today. Thanks for coming down and spending your uh, Thanksgiving with us as we're all, I guess, getting ready for family and friends and turkeys and hams and all the good things that go along with Thanksgiving, right? And uh, it's a great week, a busy week. Uh, for a lot of us with family and different ones, things going on. And last week we talked some about um, Thanksgiving, about gratitude. We're going to carry that with us again uh, today a little bit, um, a little bit about adversity. And um, anyway, let me, let, let me tell you a story, and you probably have saw this in the news, and we talked about it this past Wednesday night in Wednesday evening Bible class. But speaking of gratitude, and this was just like slapping me in the face as I was reading this. You're familiar with the great soccer star, Megan Rapinoe? Most of you. If not, you can Google her. But uh, last game of her career, and a few minutes into it, she is injured, uh, breaks her heel, something like that. Anyway, she's done. Achilles tendon. That was it. Thanks, Luke. She's done. That wasn't the thing, though. People get injured all the time, but she, uh, being the person that she is, says, well, this just proves that there is no God. Well, bless her heart. She's so special. And gets injured like that, which was a terrible injury, and I don't wish any injuries on her or anyone else. But to think that she is so wonderful, that God should just protect her while she's out there playing soccer. Because she, she's great and wonderful and lovely and all of this, that there must not be a God if I got injured. Hmm. So, Megan, would you like to be grateful for your abilities on the soccer field? Grateful for all the money that you have made while you have been a soccer star and all the publicity that you have gotten, all of these things. But no, there must not be a God because she got injured. Well, that is a story of ingratitude right there in your face. Being grateful is something that, that uh, we should do all the time. We should, we should give thanks in all circumstances, correct? Agree with me, yes. That is true, because you heard Brandon read it this morning and, uh, in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 18. Rejoice always. <laughs> this is a simple verse here, a couple of verses, three verses. It's simple, but difficult. Rejoice always. Okay, this is what the Apostle Paul is telling you. So, church, I'm telling you right now, this is what the Bible says. You don't agree with me, you're not agreeing with the Bible, you're not agreeing with Paul. Rejoice always. Just do it. Whew, that can be difficult. Pray continually. Okay, that's a good idea for us to, to be in a constant thought or prayer or, or praying a lot, uh, not forsaking uh, your prayers. But then that last one, there, give thanks in all 
all circumstances. All, I think the Apostle Paul probably drags out the all. Give thanks in all circumstances. Oh my, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in all circumstances. That one, to me, is more difficult. All circumstances. You know, we, we find that it's a pretty easy thing to do to thank God when everything's going good. But it's not as easy to thank God when things are going wrong. In fact, I venture to say we don't often thank God when a car breaks down or our boat sinks twice. <laughs> yeah, we don't say thank you, Lord, for those things. Paul's telling us, oh, give thanks in all circumstances. During adverse times, yes, yeah, difficult to be thankful, yet, but the Bible clearly teaches that we should be thankful for all the times that we go through. And today I want to outline for us a few reasons that maybe we should be thanking God for the bad times. I say maybe we should be. The Bible says we should. So I'm going to outline a few reasons for us to be grateful today, even in the bad times, even in the times where nothing's going good, even, even where, where your world is falling apart all around you, and you can't, <clears throat> you can't understand what is going on. Or maybe you're asking, God, what are you trying to teach me here? Let's look at these a little bit and learn to be thankful to God, even in the bad times. So, maybe God is using adversity to get our attention. You ever thought about that? God needs to get our attention a little bit, so He needs to ground us, to bring us back home, to, to maybe where we should be, because we just got a little bit too big. Maybe we got a little too prideful. In Acts chapter 9, we read of Saul of Tarsus, Saul, uh, in, in my opinion, was a little, was kind of proud, kind of egotistical there, seeking to rid the world of Christians, and God needed to get his attention, and so God struck him with a bright light. Read about that on the Damascus Road, and in Acts chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, he says, Who are you, Lord? That's a, I don't know if it has ever stricken you as kind of an interesting or a funny question there. It has me, and I, I keep reading over it, and I, I read this in different versions of the Bible, and all. who are you, Lord? I would think if it were me, I'd probably ask something more along the lines as, what are you doing, Lord? What is going on, Lord? But who, who are you, Lord? Hmm. God needed to get his attention, and he did. In a big way, in a big way. But going on, we read, going over to the Hebrew Bible, to the Old Testament, in Daniel chapter 4. Uh, well, let's just read it there. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as a royal residence? Now watch these key words here. That I have built. I built this by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. Huh. Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar is thinking mighty highly of himself. He goes on, even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You'll be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You'll eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Huh. A little wake-up call going on. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. 
You know, God can really get someone's attention, can he? To go from the splendor of where he lived and all that he had and with a big head of how wonderful he is to, to having his hair grow like feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. But here's where it really gets good. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. You know how many sermons I could get out of this little narrative right here? And my sanity was restored. Have you ever had one of those moments where you came to your senses? Where you realize, whoa, a light has gone off. I, I, I see clearly now. The rain is gone. (laughs) My sanity was restored. (laughs) Then, then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. I bet He did. I bet He did. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. So He went from all this patting Himself on the back to... Come into a census to realize that God is sovereign. God's in control. God owns it all. God takes care of you. Pretty good narrative there. So maybe, you know, church, maybe when we're going through, through trials, perhaps God is trying to get your attention. Perhaps. Maybe. Suffering is a tool that God used uh, uses frequently, I think, to get our attention, accomplish his purposes in our lives. When we go through trials, we're forced to turn from trusting in our own resources to looking to God for deliverance. Adversity prompts us to turn to God and cry out to him when we don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, when everything is caving in and we don't know what is going on. Have you ever asked, have you ever just come right out and said, God, what have I done? Why is this happening? You ever ask God that? I have. I have. God, can I undo whatever it is I did? Because I've often thought God has needed to get my attention, to ground me. Then we wonder, well, where does our help come from? And the psalmist says in the 121st Psalm, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. God made it all. God made it all. Secondly, adversity. God may be using adversity to maybe draw us nearer to Him. Have you ever heard of a Bertucci? If I'm saying that correctly, an Asian word, Bercucci, Bercucci. you're supposed to roll the R on that, Bercucci. A Bercucci is an Asian man who trains eagles for hunting. The capture, taming, training, keeping of eagles is highly, highly ritualized, and most eagles, which have a lifespan of about 40 years, they're caught when they're very young, either um, taken from a nest or trapped in a baited net. But once captured, the eagle's hooded, they place a hood over its head, and they place it in a cage with a per- on a perch, and this perch sways constantly so they cannot rest or sleep. For two or three days, it's deprived of food, and during this time, the Bertucci talks and sings and chants to the eagle for hours and hours and hours on end. Finally, he begins to feed the eagle and to stroke it. Slowly, the weakened creature comes to rely on its master. When the Bertucci decides that the relationship has become strong enough, then the training begins. Not all eagles can be trained, but those who take to life of the master display intense, very intense loyalty. While a training and breaking of the eagle may seem harsh, it's a picture of how over time God can break our independent spirit to draw us closer to Him. 
God has always wanted us to be with him. God seeks us earnestly. God wants us there in communion with him. But often we neglect that relationship because when things are going good and we feel that we're in full control, we don't need God. Therefore, he may send the storms of life to rattle our world that we might run for shelter in the cleft of the rock. Yeah, sometimes when things are really going good, we do neglect God. Someone said, in the day of prosperity, we have many refuge, refuges to resort to. In the day of adversity, we only have one. First Peter. Chapter 5, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, and he may lift, lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Paul, Peter, the writer here, cast all your anxiety on him. Do we do that? Do, do we put all our anxiety on God? Do we put it on him when we go into our prayer closet? And we come out, we put it right back on us. Yeah, we're supposed, to, we're supposed to give it all to God. God's an ever-present help. He's a shelter in adversity. He wants us to draw close to Him. He wants to, us to put our cares upon Him. We look to the psalmist again. 130th Psalm. Verse 1, out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. You been there? Psalmist said in the 18th Psalm, In my distress I called to the Lord. I, got, I cried to my God for help. From his temple he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. Crying out to God. God's there. God's there. He's in the same place he's always been. He's waiting for us. He wants us to cry out for him. Adversity. Again, God may be using it to strengthen us. God doesn't allow us to suffer in order to destroy us, but to kind of straighten us up, to strengthen us. We see in 1 Corinthians 10, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He'll not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you're tempted, He will also provide a way out so you can endure it. God wants us with Him. God knows our burdens. God knows what's going on in our lives. And, 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 and these burdens, burdens oftentimes strengthen us, just as you've, you've, you've heard of a, a, a butterfly coming from its cocoon. If you help that butterfly get out of its cocoon, it will die because it uses, it gains strength from breaking out of that cocoon. That's how it lives. God uses adversity to strengthen us. First Peter 5.10, and the God of all grace, God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Our strength often increases in proportion to the obstacles imposed upon it. Our strength often increases in proportion to the obstacles imposed upon it you ever done something big that maybe you didn't think you could but it was a big obstacle but it was placed there and maybe if it was smaller you wouldn't think much of it but here's a huge obstacle and you're getting ready to go up against this obstacle and you find strength to do that or maybe you amaze yourself at how well you do I remember, I remember playing football in high school, and, and we played teams that were a lot better than us, and we knew they were, and they were stronger than us and bigger than us, and we played teams that weren't quite as, as strong or as big. And the, the funny thing is, you get in this mindset that as you're getting ready to play, well, this team, this team isn't as good, you know? They're, they're not as good. In fact, their star running back, he's not even playing this week, and we're bigger than them. We, we, our offensive line's bigger, our defensive line, we got all these great people. And you go out there, and they whoop you all over the field. Yeah. And it's embarrassing. Or we're the team that's hardly done anything all year, and they, they, they look like a mess out on the football field. I mean, they just, 
you know, they're going up against the biggest team they've ever played, and there they come. And it's amazing how adversity can cause us uh, to strengthen ourselves, to get ready for something big as opposed to going to, to, to a little team or a little thing, a little obstacle in your way. God gives us strength. Our strength often increases in proportion to the obstacles imposed upon it. Then looking at Colossians chapter 1, verse 11, being strengthened with all power according, according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. Next, God may be using adversity to refine us. Proverbs 29, remove the dross from the silver, and a silversmith can produce a vessel. The dross there is the impurities from the, from, from the, the, from the silver. And in Isaiah, kind of same thing. Um, chapter 1, I'll turn my hand against you. I will thoroughly purge away your dross and remove all your impur uh, impurities. You know, God, God wants us to realize there are consequences to our decisions and actions. God uses adversity. I think God can use adversity to show us what's in our hearts. Use that adversity to, 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 to purify us. Going back to the psalmist. 119th Psalm. It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. Have you ever said that to yourself? Have you ever prayed to God say, Lord, thank you for this adversity because here's what I learned from it. Here's how I grew. Here's the good things that happened. We probably don't. Lord, thank you for taking away that adversity. Thank you for getting me past it. And Lord, by the way, it was good for me to be afflicted. I, I don't think I've ever prayed that. And really, I don't think I ever will. It was good for me to be afflicted, the psalmist says, so that I might learn from your decrees. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. I might not pray that, but I tell you what, being afflicted causes me to grow closer to God, to not walk away from Him, to do the things I should be doing. And I'll tell you right here, right now, I need to be afflicted with something to cause me to do that because I don't want to lose my soul because of my own stubborn will. It's too important. It's too important that I follow God all the way to my grave. So, Lord, it is good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn from your decrees. Let's look over in Romans here. Romans chapter 5. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out to our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Wow. And I tell you what, the master, one of the masters in the Bible at perseverance and patience, looking at Job 23, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. Yeah. Chinese proverb says a gem's not polished without rubbing, nor a man made perfect without trials. We have our trials. We have our tests in life. And then lastly, God may be using adversity perhaps to make us a blessing to others. God's ultimate goal is not my comfort. God's ultimate, ultimate goal is to save lost souls. Philippians 1, verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Who's talking here? He's the Apostle Paul. So he's saying, look, what, all this mess that has happened to me, <laughs> it's, it's served to advance the gospel. It's actually done good things. Could God be using things like that in our lives? You know, we never know what avenue God 
may use to make us a blessing to others. Whether, you know, we're ordained of God to be a blessing to others through afflictions or, or, or to be a blessing through good health and prosperity, you know, we need to look at what, what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. We don't know how God is going to use us to bless other people. We might never see this side of heaven what things we have done that actually blessed other people. Maybe it was on accident. You might say, well, there are no accidents. God's in control of it all. Okay, I'll go with that. But whatever it is, whatever the blessings might be, we, you know, it, it, we, we do our kids for kids where we buy these little, little goats for widows, and we also buy sewing machines. Our hope is to bless the widows in India with these things. But we don't know how much of a blessing all of that can produce. It's, it, it's a blessing to us to be able to do that type of thing. And I'm sure it's blessing those widows. But we just don't know how far and how deep that goes in our blessing of them. We have our Hope Medical Clinic here that we've had now over 10 years. We, we might never see all of the blessings that come out of that. In fact, I'm sure we won't. Not this side of heaven. Blessing people. Blessing people. You remember all the adversity that Joseph went through in the book of Genesis when his brothers sold him into slavery and then uh, years later, years later, I mean, this was a terrible, terrible time. Your own brother selling you into slavery. And years later, the reason behind it became apparent. We see in Genesis it says you in Genesis chapter 50, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what's now being done, the saving of many lives. Wow. I mean, that was a long, this is not like they sold him on a Monday and he's saying this on a Friday. Years had passed. Bad things had happened to him. God intended it for good. That's the important thing. That's the important thing. You never know how God is going to use you to bless others. But I encourage you, I encourage you to always be available to be a blessing to other people. Church, adversity in our lives, you know, I mean, granted, we don't like adversity in our lives. We don't like bad things happening to us. We prefer they not happen to us. At least I would, and I think you would as well. Unless you get some kind of crazy satisfaction from adversities in your life, I would assume that we try to avoid as many adversities as we can. And we do things to avoid those things. But you know, look, look at these things. Maybe God used it to get your attention or, 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 or to draw us nearer to Him, which is, which is so important, so important. To strengthen us or refine us or, or make us a blessing to others. There, there's so many reasons God could be using adversities to make us a better person. It is not, well, there, there must not be a God because I am going through this adversity right now. That's, that, that is not so. There is a God, and God who loves us very much, and a God who I think will sometimes let some adversities come our way to get us back on the right track or to bless other people. Yes, this is a week where we focus in on gratitude and being grateful, not only for all the good things. And when we say our prayers on, on Thanksgiving Day and we say, thank you, God, for our families, thank you for this food, thank you for our, our boat, and thank you for our car, and all of these things. How many of you were saying, Lord, thank you for this past year's adversities? Not many of us will. However, I'm going to make sure I do that if I lead prayer on Thanksgiving Day. Lord, thank you for the adversities. <laughs> I don't know if I'll really do that. But <laughs> nevertheless, we tend not to thank God for 
bad things happening in our lives. But let's remember the reasons that they very likely could be happening. And give God thanks anyway, because that's what we're taught to do. Give thanks in all circumstances. This morning, we're going to have an invitation song. If anyone, if anyone needs to become a Christian, you can do that today. If anyone needs to come back to the Lord, you can do that today. And you don't have to come down this aisle. If you want to talk to me later, that's okay. You talk to me. Uh, I'm ready to listen when you're ready to talk. Uh, if you just need prayers, that's okay. I'll pray with you. I'll help you however I can. Call on me. Um, every week, I, I tell you, in our bulletin is my phone number on the back page. And I tell people to call me. And sometimes people do. So today, I'm telling you this. Don't call me. <laughs> don't call me. And you think, well, man, Gary, that's not nice. No, my phone is broke. And I can't get any calls. <laughs> However, my iPad, if you, if you need me, you text me because I have my iPad, but I, you can't call me on it. But uh, I'm hoping to get my phone something fixed or whatever today, maybe this afternoon. But uh, if you need me, uh, like I said, <laughs> good luck calling me. Uh, send me a text. Maybe I'll get that or uh, call one of the elders or somebody or email me. And nevertheless, nevertheless, we're here available for you regardless. We are here. To our guests, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. We're your church while you're down here visiting. And if you need any help from us, you can call us. I mean, my phone will be fixed. You can call us. You can call others. We're here to help you, okay? So, with that being said, we're going to offer the invitation. If you have need of it this morning, we invite you to come right now while together we stand while we sing. <laughs>